So we've just been thinking about foot on trolley cases, and I argued that if we follow Foote's method, there's a very clear role for moral psychology in making discoveries in ethics. I think that's very straightforward. But if we look at Thompson now, Judith Jarvis Thompson, another great ethicist, she has a different method of trolley cases, and we'll see that in this case, it's far less clear that moral psychology has much relevance. I think it does have relevance, but it's much less straightforward. Steve, why are we doing this? Well, here's the thing. I think a lot of debates about whether or not moral psychology, discoveries in moral psychology, are relevant to ethics rages on without a lot of attention to particular ethical arguments. And it seems to me that you and I are in this position. Uh, we are engaged one way or another in ethics. You might be actually studying ethics and doing ethics, or it might just be that you're in the fortunate position some point in your life that you have to make decisions about giving, for example, and those of course will be ethical decisions, or you might be making choices about careers or something like that, where the ethical considerations will be a component there, very likely. Uh, so you and I are engaged in various sorts of ethical argument with ourselves, with other people, and we want to understand how moral psychology is relevant to particular arguments. Right? So the, the very general things are interesting. Um, but last time I taught this course, I dove straight into these very general arguments, and I felt that we quickly got to a level of abstraction where we sort of lost track of why the whole thing matters. So I want to look at some particularly good, compelling pieces of ethics, and to see whether moral psychology can make a difference there. And that's the reason for studying Thompson. She's much diff more difficult than Foote for our purposes, and um, it's a particularly good piece of ethics, I think widely regarded as such anyway. Uh, so our question, of course, is whether scientific discoveries in moral psychology could undermine or support ethical principles. And what I've just told you is that we're going to see that if we accept Thompson's other method of trolley cases, different from Foote's type of argument, then it's coherent that they might, and we can identify how they might, but this is much less straightforward. So let's dive in and just think about Thompson on her own terms. So Thompson introduces the term trolley problem. What does Thompson mean by the trolley problem? She just means this. Um, why is it that Edward may turn that trolley to save his five, but David, the surgeon, may not cut up his healthy specimen, transplant that healthy specimen's organs, and thereby save five lives? I like to call this the trolley problem in honour of Mrs Foote's example. I think it's a bit of a shame in a way, because we've distracted from some of the things that are most interesting um, about Foote. Uh, she didn't put a lot of weight on this example, but there you go, uh, not to worry about that. Now, if you're not sure what uh, the trolley case is and the transplant case is, uh, you've been asleep for most of this course, and you need to go back and just take a quick look at some of the things we've done before, or use the glossary in the notes below this. Very good. Now, Foote has an answer to this question, an answer to what Thompson calls the trolley problem. Um, it's because duties not to harm rank above duties to help. So Edward is in a situation where, you know, he can harm one person or harm five. Easy decision, let's harm one person rather than five. Uh, or help, conversely, depending on how you think about Edward, I suppose it's probably help. Uh, David, on the other hand, is a situation where he's deciding between uh, helping five people or harming one person. The harming one person is something you absolutely mustn't do, that ranks more than the helping. So his duty not to harm outranks his duty to help, even though there are five people on this side. And that's Foote's answer. And I take it there's some on the face of it kind of compelling idea behind that. Uh, and, and Foote's idea is, you know, we get there by thinking about what moves us on particular trolley cases. So what does, uh, what does Thompson say? Well, let's go back and look at the cases. Here's Edward. I take it you know what's going on here. And here's David. I take it you know what's going on here. And the question, of course, is why may Edward but not David? This is the trolley problem. And we know what Foote says. Foote says that's because David would be harming one person, whereas Edward has a choice between helping one and helping five. That's an easy choice. But if you're faced with a choice between harming one and helping five, hmm, probably you ought not to harm. That would be the, the primary thing. What does Thompson respond? Well, Thompson responds in a way that looks very superficially like Foote. I think Thompson's argument method is quite different, but the, the uh, sequence of cases looks quite similar. So what Thompson did is just what Foote did to her opponents. She introduces new cases. 
And here's for our purposes is a key case. And if you read Thompson, you'll see there are many, many cases actually. Uh, the paper's kind of whirlwind uh, of cases, but this will do for us. So she introduces Frank. Now the interesting thing about Frank versus Edward is that Edward's the driver, you remember. Uh, Frank's just a passenger. So the in Frank's scenario, the driver shouts out, oh my gosh, the brakes have failed. And I'm so shocked by this, I, I actually die on the spot. So now Frank as a passenger has a choice. Frank can let events take their course, which would result in the death of five people, or Frank can run to the front, grab the lever, turn the trolley onto a track where it will unfortunately kill one person. And the question now is, may Frank kill the... No, may, may Frank turn the trolley. May Frank turn the trolley. Now, what I hope you said is what Thompson wants you to say, which is yes. Right. Thompson says, uh, I take it that everybody will agree that if Edward may turn the trolley, then Frank may turn the trolley. So if you said no here, that's OK, as long as you've given the same answer both times. Um, what you're supposed to say is, is yes. I'm kind of nervous doing this. So if we we're in a lecture, I'd know straight away what you think about this. As things are doing now, I'm not going to know till Thursday, the live session. So um, anyway, have a think. What you're supposed to say is yes and yes. And just for now, I'm going to assume that you said that. All right. Um, there we go. And now, of course, Thompson's question is, well, look, compare Frank here to David the surgeon. What Thompson's trying to do is to create a scenario that will create problems for foot in order to defend an alternative principle. So let's see how this works. I'm going nice and slowly here. Some people will be very familiar with this already. Uh, for example, it may have come up in applied ethics. Uh, good for you. But hold with, don't, don't give up though, don't give up. Just use the fast forward button, skip ahead, because we're going to look at Thomson's method in a way that you won't have done in applied ethics. So why may Edward uh, turn the trolley, but David not cut up the people? Foote says, because duties not to harm rank above duties to help. Here's Thomson's argument. If Foote's principle were right, um, then actually Frank wouldn't be allowed to turn the trolley either. Let's have a look at that again. So the idea is this, um, Frank's case is constructed in such a way according to Thompson, that if Frank does nothing, then he fails to help five people, where if he pulls the lever, he's thereby harming one person in order to help five people. Right. So Thompson wants to say, if Foote's analysis of these cases were right, then she ought to conclude that Frank can't turn the trolley any more, Dave, any more than David can cut apart people in his lab and distribute their organs. But Thompson takes it that Foot wouldn't say that and that you wouldn't say that. And therefore that we shouldn't accept that the explanation for these cases is that duties not to harm rank above duties to help. Now, it's important here, Thompson's not actually rejecting the principle. She says she thinks the principle might be true. She's rejecting the principle as an explanation of why Edward may turn the trolley, but David may not cut people apart. Thompson thinks it's not the right explanation of that fact even if it's a true principle. So here's Thompson's argument. Um, if Foot were right, then Frank may turn the trolley, may not turn the trolley. But as a matter of fact, Frank may turn the trolley, and therefore Foot's principle is, is wrong. Now I'm simplifying, I'm making this a bit cruder than it ought to be. But the details for our purposes don't matter a lot. It would matter tremendously if we were doing applied ethics, but this is, this is okay for our purposes. Close enough, all right, very good. And Thompson uses this to defend a further proposal. So really her conclusion isn't that Foote is wrong. It's rather that the truth of her principle is to be preferred to the truth of Foote's principle. Uh, and if Foote's principle is true, then so much the better for her, because that gives actually even stronger support for her principle. So her principle is this. What matters is whether the agent distributes a threat by doing something to the threat, or whether... Uh, she's using the he form here from the 70s, but you're not from the 70s, so you won't use that, will you? Uh, so we'll say she, whether she distributes it by doing something to a person. That's the idea. So are you distributing a threat by doing something to the threat or doing something to a person? Let's see how Thompson's proposal works out here. So in the case of Frank, the idea is that Frank is distributing a threat, death by trolley, uh, between the five people and the one people, and he's distributing the threat by doing it something to the trolley. So according to Thompson, that's okay. That's okay, right? Um, I've got to tell you, I found, that, I found this terribly implausible. I don't know why, but that doesn't seem right to me that it's okay to do something to the threat, but not to the person. Uh, we'll come back to that later. I don't know how you feel about that, but I'm just telling you what Thompson thinks. 
Now Thompson goes to the case of David and what you notice about David is that David is doing something to the healthy person, uh, namely killing her, taking her organs and distributing them among some patients. So Thompson's principle clearly tells us, if we accept this principle, that David may not kill the healthy person, whereas Frank may turn the trolley. David is doing something to the person. Frank is not doing something to the person. He's doing something to the threat, namely the trolley. So Thompson. All right. Now, what we've done so far is we've looked at Thompson's argument just in outline. If you read the paper, you'll see that there's a great deal more subtlety there, many more cases and qualifications. But I don't think the details of that are going to make a big difference to us. You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Okay, good. That's exactly what I want to hear. Uh, you, you're a bit cheeky, but that's exactly what I want to hear. You're going to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I am often wrong about these things, actually. So what we've got to do here is to be very careful to distinguish normative from psychological claims. You'll get into all kinds of trouble with all kinds of philosophers if you don't do that. So let's make this simple. It's not very difficult. Uh, here's a normative question. Why is it that Edward may turn the trolley while David may not cut up the healthy human? Right? So here's a, here's a normative question. You can see that because it involves the word may. The word may appears twice there and that tells us that we're dealing with a, a normative question about what may be done. Distinguish that from a psychological question. I helpfully numbered them both one. Um, what determines why some people judge, on reflection, that Edward turned the trolley while David may not cut up the healthy person? So here we've got um, a fact that we can observe. People make judgments, right? And we know that there is a pattern of judgments, not the only pattern, but a very common pattern of judgments is Edward may, David may not. And the question is, what determines why they make those judgments? Now, when we were looking at Foote, I suggested Foote's method of trolley cases works like this. Foote starts with a, a psychological claim. She uses guesswork to establish that, but we could use moral psychology, wouldn't change the argument. She starts with a psychological claim. It's because we're concerned not to harm people more than to help them. It's because we have that ranking of priorities that we have certain pattern of judgments. Foote then infers, as I understand her, from the pattern of judgments, the exp sorry, the explanation from the pattern of judgments, the psychological explanation of the judgments, to a principle. Now that explanation is not supposed to be deductive. Foote doesn't think, she's not confusing psychological and normative questions. She's thinking that the psychological questions can provide support for normative principles. So the normative principle is uh, we rank, we should rank not harming people above helping people. That's her idea. And then from there, we get back to an answer to the normative question. So Foote goes psychological, principle, and then goes back to the normative question. What about Thompson? What's her method? I want to suggest to you that Thompson's method is quite different from Foote's method. Here's what I think, and in particular, I don't think Thompson is making any use at all of psychological premises, unlike Foote. So here's what I take Thompson's method to be. She thinks there's a morally relevant difference between David and Edward, and that's a premise. Sorry, the fact that there is one is a premise. Um, another premise is that there's no morally relevant difference between Edward and Frank. So that's a premise for her as well. Now, I don't think in Foote's argument, these are premises. We don't actually need their truth at all. Whereas in Thompson's argument, I think we do. And then you ask, uh, sorry, and then you go on, you've got some more premises like this, and you notice that these are all premises about particular scenarios. They're all premises about particular scenarios. The name is a nice way of illustrating that. And somehow from here, we draw an inference. I don't know quite how, but we do draw an inference and we get to a conclusion, which is that the truth of Thompson's principle is to be preferred to the truth of Foote's principle. Thompson's principle, you remember, is that it's OK to do something to the threat, but not to the person. That was Thompson's principle. All right. So there's two questions we can ask here. One is, how does a reader know that this premise is true? So I take it that Thompson, in communicating with you and I, writing this paper, she expects that you and I are in, in a position, or could be in a position if we're, you know, thoughtful enough, to know that her premises are true. Right? We, there must be a way that we can know this. And Thompson herself doesn't seem that bothered about this question, so she just thinks it's obvious. It seems to be obvious to her and obvious to people around her. So it's supposed to be obvious to you and I as well, I think. That's how we're supposed to know this. Uh, so we're supposed to know that there's a difference between these things just by thinking about the scenarios. So this would be, I think, a candidate for the kind of thing that a philosopher might say is self-evident in Audi's sense. I think this is quite a good 
case for this. If there are self-evident propositions in ethics, uh, this is one which has a reasonable chance of being true. All right, so that's the first thing. Now, that points us to, the, to a thought. Moral psychology could be relevant to us here because it may be that discoveries in moral psychology can show us that we don't actually have a basis for accepting the premise. We have an illusion of knowing, but not genuine knowledge. Now, I'm not saying that moral psychology can do that, that's to follow, but I'm saying this. If moral psychology could show that we don't know the premise, then that would be relevant because it would allow us to go from thinking, Thompson has an argument where we know the premise is to be true, and we might therefore think even that we know the conclusion, to thinking that Thompson's argument fails. So that would be a discovery in ethics supported by evidence from moral psychology. So I think if, if, that, were, if that were the case, we'd have a clear connection between moral psychology and ethics. The two things would be relevant to each other. Now, you may say, look, you know, Steve, I want to see that happen. I want to see that happen. And I'm glad you're saying that because I'm just about to come on and try and show you that, that that can happen, although it's going to be pretty tricky to work out how it works. By way of a preview, though, we might say this. There are lots of cases in other areas, other domains of inquiry, where scientific discoveries have shown philosophers that what they thought they knew are not things that they actually know. So think about the physical world. Many philosophers previously, you know, right right up until the 16th, 17th centuries, thought they knew all kinds of things about the physical world on the basis of informal observation. But a series of scientific discoveries showed that the physical world behaves quite differently from the way that it seems to behave. And the tension there was so strong that, you know, people actually lost their lives, right? There were major conflicts over this. And that's partly, I think, because there's a difference between how things seem and how they really are in the case of the physical. Uh, and what we know from more recent discoveries in psychology is that there's a good reason why things seem that way. So things seem to you and I, much as they did to Aristotle and his contemporaries, although you and I know that things are not really as they seem, or at least we would know that if we did a little bit of physics. I haven't done much physics, so I don't know very much about how things are, but I do know that things are entirely different, uh, very different from, from how they seem. For example, the trajectories on which things move are not the trajectories in which they seem to move. So it wouldn't be surprising if moral psychology allowed us to discover that the way things seem in moral scenarios is quite different from the way they are. Yes, there is a difference. So in the case of the physical, we are much, probably collectively as philosophers, we're much more inclined to be um, realists in the sense we think there are facts to be discovered. In the case of ethics, it's less clear that we should think there are facts to be discovered. I, I don't think that's going to worry us, but you're right, this matter's complicated. All right, Steve, what are you saying? You're waffling on here. Stop waffling. Good. You tell him. Right. What we're saying is this. Thompson's argument requires that the reader can know the premise. Not just Thompson herself, but also her readers need to be in a position to know the premise. If discoveries in moral psychology show that although the premise initially seems obvious, we don't have grounds for accepting it, then that will be a case where discoveries in moral psychology have consequences that undermine our grounds for accepting ethical principles. So we'll have a connection. But there's another way that this could go. You see, Thompson's principle, I mentioned earlier, is something that I found very hard to accept. So Thompson says, it's okay to act on the threat, the trolley, but it's not okay to act on the person. Now, I was surprised when I read that in Thompson because I was aware of this as a principle, but I'd always assumed in the past that that principle was offered as a kind of morally irrelevant framing effect. That's to say that people thought, people did recognise that as a matter of fact, it's part of why people make judgments. People are influenced by whether one is acting on the threat or on the person. That does explain some of the variation in responses. But I was always thought that was supposed to show that people were swayed by ethically irrelevant factors, at least when they were being fairly spontaneous and not too reflective. And so this was a sort of an objection to the claim that we can get at ethical principles via trolley cases. So I was quite surprised to see that Thompson thinks, no, 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 this is a, a, actually an ethically relevant difference, turning the trolley versus attacking the person. Right? She thinks that's ethically relevant. And it seems to me that that's ethically irrelevant in the way that distance is ethically irrelevant. But notice here, now I'm in an interesting position. 
So I'm a consumer, I'm a reader of Thomson's argument. What should I do? On the one hand, I've got the initial sense that her principle is false. That's my sense. But I don't really have an argument here. It just, I just, I always thought it was false. And now I find out, well, I was just wrong to think that other people think of this as an ethical principle. But presumably there's some room for disagreement on this, right? So it strikes me as false. And then this strikes me as true. But now here, I've, all I've got really is this. I've got the conclusion strikes me as false. The premise strikes me as true. How should I weigh those two things up? How should I weigh those two things up? Now, for a reader like me, and I take it I'm probably not the only person in this situation, if a discovery of moral psychology didn't entirely undermine the basis I have for accepting the premise, but just weakened it enough so that my antecedent scepticism about Thompson's principle now seems stronger, right? that's, that's pretty weak. I really don't know whether Thompson's principle is true. I really don't know whether the, there is a moral difference between David and Edward. But if moral psychology's discoveries allowed me to weaken my strength that there is a morally re relevant difference without undermining my conviction that Thompson's principle is false, then I would kind of lean that way, or it could go the other way as well. So moral psychology, in order to be relevant to drawing ethical conclusions, doesn't have to entirely undermine justification. It might selectively weaken the justification that a person has, and thereby turn that person to accepting or rejecting a conclusion, whereas she would otherwise not do so. So moral psychology can be relevant here just by altering the strength of justification that we have for these premises, or indeed, I think that's plausible. Um, I don't think that we're going to discover in moral psychology reasons to accept or reject Thompson's principle, although that's, of course, possible in principle. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Where are we in conclusion? Let me tell you where we've got to so far. First of all, I think that unlike in Foote's case, there's no straightforward link between moral psychology and Thompson's method of trolley cases. In that respect, Thompson is quite different from Foote. But this is a sign that Thompson is actually more helpful to us because those philosophers who don't think that moral psychology is relevant to ethics are presumably not that impressed with what I was calling Foote's method of trolley cases. And now Foote is such a an important figure that they would probably disagree with my interpretation of Foote rather than reject Foot, Foote's actual method. But whatever the case, that's, that's not too important. Um, they probably endorse something much more like Thompson's method of trolley cases. And if they do that, we want to be able to show that moral psychology is still relevant to them, right? Because you and I, at least for the purposes of this course, don't actually know what the right methods are in ethics. That's not part of our problem. Otherwise, things get out of hand. Um, so we're left with a question. Uh, although there's no straightforward link between discoveries in moral psychology and Thompson's method of trolley cases, there are ways in which moral psychology might potentially weaken our conviction in the premises, or more carefully, they might weaken our grounds for accepting Thompson's premises. So if we can answer this question, we'll get closer to our overall aim, which is to understand how moral psychology can be relevant for ethics. We need to know, this is coming up next, which, if any, discoveries in moral psychology could weaken someone's grounds for accepting Thompson's premises.